purposes. At the end of the day, I come back to the fact that the, the, I think the focus of the U.S. government has to be in terms of protecting the liberty of its own citizens. James Madison warned, warned that war is, in fact, the true nurse of executive aggrandizement. I think we've seen that throughout our history. Randolph Bourne, a social critic of the 20th century, commented that war is the health of the state, that you know, the, the fastest way, the quickest way to lose your liberties is to have a, a militaristic policy, to have one of constant intervention abroad. So there really are two levels of analysis here. The first is legally, when can we go to war? I would argue in terms of uh, you know, domestic law, certainly self-defense, no doubt about that, including pre preemptive strikes to defend the United States, responding to attacks by others. I think, however, that those decisions, you know, anything beyond an immediate defensive reaction needs to be something made by Congress, that these are not decisions to be made by the President alone. International law, in many ways has certain similarities, that is self-defense and alliance relationships are, are certainly preserved as part of the United Nations Charter. Beyond that, normally Security Council approval is required, but there's this evolving area of law. And again, recognizing the fact that powerful states can more or less do what they want. At some point in the future, maybe that will change, but I'm not uh, going to hold my breath. It strikes me the most important issue is, for the United States at least, being the most powerful nation, being the country most able to go to war whenever it desires, for whatever purpose, that self-restraint and humility would be very useful. You know, recognizing that we have extraordinary power, well, that gives us also extraordinary responsibility to use it well and use it carefully. We have to be very cognizant of the costs, the unintended consequences, and the potential dangers at the end of the road of using that power, and that should suggest that we should be very, very hesitant before we resort to power, and only once we make that judgment do we get to the question of whether or not it would be legal to use it. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Bandow, for taking the trouble to come here and give us your insights. Uh, uh, I find myself largely in agreement and, and will confine myself to perhaps some some footnotes uh, to what Mr. Banda said. Um, uh, with respect to sanctions short of war, I think uh, he's absolutely right that, that those uh, can often be ineffective. I mean, this in a way cuts against his argument. I mean, his argument against war would be much nicer if he could say, oh, well, we'll use sanctions instead. But uh, oh, we have to recognize that the sanctions often are of limited utility in achieving the aim, and often the sanctions do cause significant harm, often the kind of harm that, that, that is caused by, uh, by express uh, war. Uh, I would just cite one more example, going back a little bit farther, is the sanctions imposed against Rhodesia uh, in 1965 by the Security Council, which was really the first time that that was done uh, in the UN Charter era uh, as a way of forcing that government to move in the direction of majority rule uh, in, in Rhodesia rather than, than rule by the, the, the European minority. Um, and those sanctions were in effect for about 15 years, and there really isn't any great reason to believe that, that they had a significant impact on, on the outcome of, of things in, in Rhodesia. Um, with respect to, uh, to self-defense, I, I think it, it is, again, appropriate uh, uh, to confine it rather narrowly, not to allow so-called preventive self-defense, that is to say, uh, you know, someone might attack us sometime in, in the future, we'll get them now. Uh, uh, if, you, if you put that in a context, let's say, like the situation that's existed for many years between India and Pakistan, I think you can readily see how that could, could spin out of control. Either Pakistan or India could reasonably make the argument, well, the other one may attack us sometime in the future, so let's attack first. So it's, it, if you expand self-defense too much, it's really a prescription uh, uh, for, for war. Uh, the, the, the 1967 war uh, in, in, in uh, the Middle East is one that, that uh, uh, I would say was more in the character, actually, of preventive war. Uh, I don't think that, that it was one where, where there was uh, military force about to be used and force was used in order to prevent that. Uh, that's the way it was depicted at the time. That's the way it was believed by the major powers. Uh, uh, at the time, it was only the Arab states and the Soviet Union that said this is aggression by Israel. Uh, uh, and I think that, that the subsequent history has actually proved the Arab states and the Soviet Union to have been correct on that because uh, the, the uh, uh, many officials of the Israeli government in subsequent years 
said about the 1967 war, you know, we really didn't have to go to war against Egypt. Uh, they weren't about to attack us. Um, so, uh, I mean, but that points up another major issue that Mr. Bandow focused on, I think, very usefully, and that is facts, uh, how facts uh, are, are very key in all these determinations. Uh, and it, you can very readily go to war if you say the facts are a certain way. And Mr. Bannon mentioned the, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, where, where President Johnson used facts quite creatively in order to convince the Congress that it was necessary to use military force. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, uh, you, know, you may, might even make that argument with respect to Kosovo uh, with President Clinton. President Clinton, when he announced that the beginning of the, of the operation, the military operation in March of, of 1999, focused quite heavily on a, an event in a little village called Rachak, uh, uh, where he said that the, uh, 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 the, the Serb forces uh, had massacred civilians. Um, there was subsequently some investigation done about that, and it's very dubious, without going into details, it's very dubious whether there ever was a massacre. Uh, but this, if you look at Mr. Uh, Clinton's press statements at the time of the initiation of military action, this was his, 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 his big point, was, uh, look what they did in this village, we've got to stop them. Um, well, did they do anything in that village? You know, maybe yes, uh, maybe no. Um, humanitarian intervention, for that reason, I think, does need to be limited, as Mr. Bandow suggests. I think it, it, it in particular, is subject uh, to manipulation for other reasons, and that's why it, it has generally been disfavored as, as a matter uh, of, of international law. Uh, you have examples of, of United States intervention on, on, on the basis of preserving uh, uh, the lives even of its own nationals, which is kind of one form of, of humanitarian intervention. Um, uh, you have that in the Dominican Republic in 1965, where we said we had to send in the Marines in order to protect U.S. nationals. But it turns out most of the U.S. nationals who wanted to leave the Dominican Republic had already left by the time the Marines got there. Um, uh, same thing again in 1983 in Grenada, where we said we had to go in to protect some medical students uh, who were in danger. Well, it turns out there had been people from the State Department there over the weekend before the invasion convincing the medical students uh, that they were in danger, and that there was really no objective reason to believe that, that, that they ever were. So, I mean, those uh, um, uh, fact issues uh, come into play quite strongly. Um, on the domestic side, I, I think the, the focus is, is perfectly appropriate on the Constitution and on, on the power of Congress to declare war. Uh, that that was the, the, the framers intent, that there would be uh, a, a division between the executive and the legislative branches on this issue. The president is commander in chief, but that doesn't mean that the president decides when to go to war. Um, uh, and and, and that, that provision was put into the, the Constitution uh, for that uh, purpose. Uh, there's another actually very curious provision in the Constitution that, that's also something of a limitation. Um, among the powers of Congress uh, in Article 3 of the Constitution, uh, one is to provide for a navy, one is to pro provide for an army, um, another is to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Uh, because there were militia in the different colonies at, at that time. The, nowadays, we call them the, the reserves. Um, uh, and under that provision of the Constitution, uh, there seem to, be, seem to be limitations on what the, the Congress can do in calling them up. It says they can call forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union to suppress insurrections and repel invasions. As you're probably aware, there are reserve units in the Middle East quite prominently. Um, uh, and, you know, does that comport with what the Constitution says? Uh, uh, to put it another way, could the governor of some state say, well, I don't want my, uh, my reserve troops to, to, to go there? Um, this actually has been raised before and has gone before the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court it basically decided against the governor of Minnesota uh, uh, in a case in, in uh, I think the early 1990s when he tried to object to uh, the sending of the Minnesota National Guard to Central America for training, where 
the governor of Minnesota wasn't too happy with what the United States was doing in Central America at the time, uh, and, and sued the Defense Department uh, to stop the, uh, 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 the sending of those. Uh, the, the US, and, and actually won in a panel of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, uh, they read that uh, provision in the Constitution and said, yeah, that's right, the governor uh, has control. Um, uh, it went on bonk, uh, uh, and then to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, uh, uh, no, the Defense Department is right, but um, without going into the details, uh, that was the, the conclusion. Um, but um, the, the, at the international level, uh, as well, I think you know it, it's perfectly appropriate that Mr. Bando points out the, the strictures on the use of force. The force there as well uh, uh, is, is to be used for defensive uh, purposes. Uh, uh, and there, of course, have been these proposals that, that he, he uh, as he called them, the responsibility to protect, uh, proposals that, that have been kind of widely discussed, but haven't, ha haven't really entered into the corpus of, of the law. Uh, but, but those proposals, while well-intentioned, do often uh, wind up uh, being ineffective or causing more trouble th 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 than, uh, uh, th than, than the harm that they were to, to protect. So I think it, it is appropriate uh, to be cautious there as well. Um, the, the Security Council uh, uh, has, to some extent, ceded its powers to, to the major powers in, in, the, in the, the, the post Cold War world. Uh, uh, and the, the major powers, in particular the UK and the United States, uh, have fallen into the habit of taking Security Council resol resolutions that say something about a situation and saying, well, they really mean that we can go to war. Uh, when it's rather dubious that, that, that they really say that. Um, I think it's five minutes to one, and I should probably leave some time for questions. Yeah, we'll take questions from the audience, so we'll just go ahead and ask. I have a question as to motivations. It seems that the Obama administration during the 2008 campaign promised to limit the executive sort of power, that it, this growth of executive power when it came to going to war, and then uh, magically, when uh, the Obama administration took office, none of those, none of those things really changed. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to go beyond the conspiracy. I don't think it's these presidents, you know, whether you're Clinton or Bush or the Obama administration, that are trying to uh, retain these power for dubious purposes. Maybe, obviously, they have some motivations that that they're uh, making these decisions after. How do we? Because um, I have the belief that the executive power when it comes to war has gone too far. I want to limit these things. But as these presidents sit in their position as commander in chief and as they are getting information from whether that's national interest, security, or others, they're they're motivated by these things. I don't think they're just like, how are we going to like keep my power? So my question to you is, how do we how do we convince the executive that it's in their best interest? Other than these costs that you talked about that they, they need to limit the power that they've been exercising for such a long time since so Nixon. Well, I don't, I don't remember the president ever promising to roll back executive war making. Now, he talked about some of the other anti-terrorism issues in Guantanamo and whatever. I don't remember him saying anything about war making. I think you have to go back to Dwight Eisenhower, to a president who talked about the role of Congress in terms of making these decisions. I, I think part of it's simply what, what president wants to have less power than the president before him. For a president, pre precedent sounds pretty powerful. Well, you know, I mean, Bush did it, and Obama did it, you know, and Nixon did it, and I mean, you know, so why shouldn't I have the same powers? I think that trying to persuade somebody, other than this is what the Constitution says, you should go along with it, it needs to be Congress. I mean, what, the two things have happened. One is presidents have proved to be very, you know, active in using that power, and Congress, I think, for the most part, has said, fine, but, you know, politically, it's a lot easier to say, you go do your thing. If it goes well, we applaud. If it goes badly, we complain. And I think it's utter political irresponsibility. And you also find there's enormous partisanship there. Routinely, Congress's you know, members change sides depending on the partisan nature of the president. I mean, in, uh, you know, so I think it was 19, 1994, Robert Dole was talking about the importance of having Congress you know, go out there and make the decision on putting troops into Bosnia and whatever. And then by 1999, you know, he was leading the charge in terms of going into Kosovo. One of the best examples is a congressman, a Major Owens from New York, who when Reagan invaded uh, Grenada, I did an article on this for the Wall Street Journal of how these partisan shifts, Major Owens said, oh, I hope Reagan doesn't also invade Haiti. 
Well, in 1994, when Bill Clinton was threatening to invade Haiti, Owens was up there saying, this is fabulous, we should do this. I mean, utter, you know, because, well, one of them is a Democratic president, one's a Republican, he was a Democrat. So I think a lot of it has to do with partisan. So we need a Congress that's more willing to reassert, you know, its privileges and also what I would argue kind of a public interest as well.